a doctor from this province now working in the U.S. He wanted to stay here. Why did it cost taxpayers $50,000? I don't want this to ever happen to another resident at Memorial ever again. New provincial marijuana legislation will come down hard on those selling to minors. Imprisonment for up to two years and fines up to $100,000. We cared about him, we drove him places, we picked him up coffees and lunch and you know we tried to help him with dating advice. But Alex Seymour betrayed their trust and videotaped his female co-workers at a Mount Pearl Fitness Center. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. We start tonight with a fatal accident at a high-rise construction site in downtown St. John's. Here now is Katie Breen is at the corner of Springdale and New Gower joining us now live. Katie, what can you tell us about what happened? Well, the accident happened just before 4 o'clock today. When we happened upon the scene, we saw a man, a construction worker with his helmet off. He was looking up at the building, rubbing the top of his head, just totally distressed about what had gone on. Um, we parked the car and when we got out, we came across witnesses who say they saw what happened. A man had fallen from the top of the building. They said they, he landed on his back. They say when EMS arrived, they immediately laid a tarp over the body. Um, witnesses say they, that the man, they were told that he was between ages tw uh, 32, 33. I wasn't able to confirm the identity of the deceased, uh, the company that he worked for or the position he was in, but I can tell you about the scene today. Uh, at the new Fortis building across the street, you could see workers uh, looking at the building from the windows. There was police here, there were uh, ambulances and uh, fire trucks, and actually still on scene. Some of the construction workers, they're huddled at the bottom of the building. Um, police did speak with reporters earlier today. They also said they couldn't confirm the identity of the deceased. When asked uh, whether or not the man was wearing a safety harness, they say that too is part of the ongoing investigation. Construction at the site has been closed. It's expected to be a Hilton hotel that was supposed to at least open uh, next winter. Reporting live, I'm Katie Breen in St. John's. The end of prohibition on cannabis is coming as early as this summer, and now we know much more about how the government will adapt to the pending legalization of recreational marijuana. Here are some of the key components of the proposed new Cannabis Control Act. You cannot possess more than 30 grams of cannabis in a public place. You cannot grow more than four cannabis plants for personal use, and retailers cannot sell more than 30 grams at a time. There will be steep penalties for those who violate the act, especially if you're caught selling cannabis to a minor. These and other details were released today at Confederation Building, and our Terry Roberts was there to take it all in. He joins us now live from our newsroom. Terry? Well, yes, Debbie, the province says it will be ready when Ottawa passes legislation making it legal to produce, uh, buy and sell cannabis marijuana. Uh, so it's making some changes to some existing legislation, including the Highway Traffic Act. But the most substantive change is contained in this document right here, the new Cannabis Control Act. The legalization of cannabis is one of the largest policy shifts this province has ever seen. Once passed into law, this act will strictly regulate cannabis. It will also give the province's liquor corporation sweeping powers. The legislation that we are announcing today provides provisions for police officers or NLC inspectors to enter the, prem the premises of licensees, producers, and other places of business without a warrant to ensure compliance with the act. But some of the stiffest penalties are reserved for anyone who might sell marijuana to a young person. Up to two years in prison. A maximum of 100000 in fines. And we will do whatever we can to discourage cannabis youth, use by youth and to ensure use by adults is done as safely as possible. Stringent rules for sale, purchase and consumption. Even the transportation of cannabis must be done by a big name company like Canada Post all with the intent of protecting public safety. But will the rules be nimble enough to put a dent in the massive black market? I mean, we hope so. This is a brand new industry for us. Fines up to $500 for consuming cannabis in public, up to $10,000 for consuming or possessing open cannabis in a vehicle or boat, and zero tolerance for novice and commercial drivers. Measures welcomed by safe driving advocates. This is one of the strongest laws set up in Canada for road safety. 
the other province that is above us right now is really PEI. So yes, we're pleased. Uh, we'd like to see it enacted as quickly as possible. Now what's uh, clear in this is that you can still, you will be able to buy cannabis products online but only from the Provincial Liquor Corporation. Now, government said today, look, they understand this is not a perfect system, and they expect, just like uh, with uh, uh, alcohol and tobacco, there will probably always will be a black market for these products, but the quest for government right now is to squeeze out the black market as much as possible. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Terry Roberts for Here and Now. My wife and I, we were devastated. We were absolutely devastated for probably half that year. A young doctor says Eastern Health wasted $50,000 after yanking a job offer to St. Clair's Hospital. Now, Dr. Chris Nicholas is thriving in Buffalo, New York, and he doubts he'll ever practice here in his home province where he studied medicine for 13 years. All right, going to bring Carolyn in in just a moment for uh, weather, but uh, we've got something else to talk about. Yeah, we'd like to toot our own horn just a little bit and congratulate some of our colleagues here at CBC Television. Mm -hmm, that's right, some of the crew here at CBC Newfoundland and Labrador being recognized by the Radio Television Digital News Association of Canada for their hard work. Congratulations. You might remember Access Denied, a series on accessibility in this province that tackled everything from rude encounters directed at people with disabilities to building building and sidewalk designs that make a difference. CBC producer Jen White and journalist Ramona Deering worked incredibly hard on this project and it just received the National Adrian Clarkson Diversity in Television Award. So <sighs> kudos to our colleagues uh, for doing so well with that series. Big national award. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. It is fantastic. Congratulations, Jen and Ramona, <laughs> and the crew also. Who were right. Lots Mark of Cumbie. people Mark behind Cumbie the also scenes, did a lot of shooting, and our so. editor, Paul Congrats. Pickett, and others. I'm sorry yeah. if I've excluded any names. <laughs> we'll roll the credits at the end of the show. <laughs> right. Well, we do have some weather on the way. Today was lovely in St. John's. Mm -hmm. Nice, bright, sunny Great day, day, but that is uh, going to change tomorrow night and uh, going to change for much of the island as well. So let's have a look. There is a special weather statement in effect for the entire island and for southeastern parts of Labrador, and that's because of uh, this low here and this uh, trough over Quebec that will merge over the island uh, Oh, tonight and into tomorrow. So we have some showers that will come across uh, the west coast of the island overnight tonight into tomorrow. And then this will start to track east throughout the day. The east won't really see much of this until uh, tomorrow evening. That's when the rain will really ramp up. You can see it changing over to some snow uh, as we get into the evening hours. And you can see the intensity of the rain uh, ramping up there overnight and uh, the, the, the snow <laughs> moving down down there on the northern peninsula and along the west coast overnight on Wednesday. So yeah, it's going to bring a pretty messy system to the province uh, tomorrow. I'll get into uh, more details a bit later. Thank you, Carolyn. The two-month strike in Labrador City is now over. 79% of the striking steel workers that voted today accepted a tentative deal reached on Friday with the Iron Ore Company of Canada. Local 5795 President Ron Thomas says union management is recommending acceptance of the deal, which includes increases to pensions and raises the limit on drug costs. Roughly 1,300 workers have been on the picket line in Labrador City since late March. Stop clawing back child support payments from people who get income support. That is the message the Child and Youth Advocate has for the provincial government. In a report today, Advocate Jackie Lake Cavanaugh says that anyone who gets child support from a former partner loses income support from the province, dollar for dollar. She says the policy hurts mostly single families led by women. The provincial government says her report will be taken into account during a policy review which is now underway. Big damage done over the weekend in downtown St. John's. According to the city, more than 60 parking meters were vandalized. Damage on downtown meters has been staggering. Since 2015, more than 1,000 meters have been targeted. That's almost all of them. At the beginning of this year, the city had shelled out $1.4 million for repairs. The city says it's still assessing how much it'll cost to repair the 60 meters that were hit over the weekend. Well, some young hockey players from this province are now national champions. Yeah, has Crossman with him. Gives it to Crossman. Ethan Crossman, empty net. Three, nothing. Tito 
That is the scene as the Acadie Bathurst Tita won the Memorial Cup for the first time in their history. Five players from this province are on the team. Adam Howell of St. John scored the winning goal in the first period as the Teton defeated the host Regina Pats 3-0. Other players from here include Jordan Marr, Liam Leonard, Zachary Bennett and Evan Fitzpatrick. Well, now to a Here and Now exclusive that is part of our Critical Condition series on this province's health care system. We often hear that it's difficult to keep Newfoundland doctors here, specialists in particular. One radiology specialist says he and his wife wanted nothing more than to settle down here and stay, but they didn't. Now, I've been working on this with our CBC Investigates team and got to learn a lot more about this young doctor. Dr. Chris here at Great Lakes Medical Imaging. We're in the Great Lakes Medical Imaging outpatient facility at Park Club Lane. Today we're going to do a biopsy. As you can see from the videos he makes, interventional radiology is his passion. My name is Dr. Chris and I'm an interventional radiologist. I was really attracted to the specialty. It was cutting edge. It was a perfect mix between uh, using imaging technology and seeing patients. And I really just fell in love with the discipline. Memorial Radiology! <laughs> As he started his residency at Munn, he and his wife Becky would eventually move to Vancouver for Nicholas to do a one-year fellowship before coming back home. They bought a house in St. John's and they co-wrote a popular blog as they renovated the home they thought they would settle down in. We consciously made the choice to keep our house um, while we went away for that year to Vancouver, um, knowing that we were going to be coming right back and we'd just slip right back into it and live in it. At first, Eastern Health recognized Nicholas's abilities and in 2013 offered him a job here at St. Clair's Hospital. And he earned a $50,000 bursary. That's provincial tax dollars designed to keep talented doctors in the province for at least three years. An issue. Dr. Rick Batia, the clinical chief of diagnostic imaging at Eastern Health, wrote in an email that Chris was a great resident and that his application would receive his strongest support. So today, we're launching uh, our fibroid clinic. Uh, Nicholas received accolades and won awards for his student teaching abilities at both Munn and UBC. But as he was planning to return from Vancouver, his career path changed, and so did Nicholas's relationship with Dr. Adrian Major, the Divisional Chief of Diagnostic Imaging at St. Clair's and his one-time mentor. In December of 2016, Nicholas was home for Christmas and he asked Major if he could delay his start here in July of 2017. Why? Because he wanted to pursue a pilot's license. Ever since I was younger, I really wanted to fly and get a pilot's license, uh, specifically in rotary wing or helicopters. So there's no helicopter uh, flight schools on the island. So I thought, you know, while I'm away in Vancouver, this could be my only opportunity to really actually get a good crack at it. Nicholas would later regret asking to delay that start date. In an email, Major tells Nicholas, while I believe extracurricular activities can well round a person, your activities appear to outweigh your commitment to your primary profession. He didn't see how it was possible that somebody be dedicated to interventional radiology, but also get a pilot's license, which I guess is his opinion, but I know plenty of physicians who have a pilot's license. Nicholas withdrew his request for a late start date, apologized for asking for it in the first place, but it was too late. During a conference call in March with Major and other radiologists, Nicholas is told they have reviewed the needs at St. Clair's and there is no longer a job there for him. It was devastating and with his career plans in ruins, he was worried he'd have to pay back the $50,000 given to keep him here. I met with the VP medical and he said that no it was you don't have to repay it because it wasn't you who defaulted on your contract it was us who pulled your contract. Nicholas wanted it in writing. In November of last year Dr. Larry Altine sent a letter to Nicholas that says there is no position at St. Clair's and he has no obligation to repay the $50,000. Nicholas says he was willing to speak with here and now for one main reason. There needs to be some accountability. How can one person or two people decide that, that nope, this person doesn't have a job and instantly just 
poof, $50,000 of taxpayer money disappears in a thin air. That's, that's not right to me. In this case, Newfoundland's loss appears to be Buffalo's gain. The practice in Buffalo I'm in now, um, everybody's like-minded. I feel like I was ostracized for having a social media presence in my previous role as a resident in Memorial. Uh, and now I'm working for a company who values that social media presence. In fact, we started a YouTube channel with the company I'm working with, uh, featuring myself as well as my, my interventional radiology partner, Dr. John Marshall. And we've started a totally novel concept where we take the viewers on YouTube into our procedures. This is Rebecca Peckham, Becky Peckham. This is actually my wife. For 13 years, Nicholas says he enjoyed a high quality, highly subsidized medical education in Newfoundland, but now he and his wife are gone. Becky and I are the happiest we've ever been. Um, and we really gave Newfoundland the fighting chance. We did everything in our power to get back there. And after you get treated that way, it's very difficult to come back. Um, you just don't feel welcome. Now, I asked to speak with all of the doctors that we've named this evening in this story. Nicholas even signed a waiver of his privacy rights to allow the doctors to talk openly about the details of his case, but we were told that they could not comment because of Eastern Health's privacy regulations. Now, the health authority did speak to me in general terms about the resident bursary program and says that overall, the program is tremendously successful and has kept many, many doctors in the province. It is extremely rare when we've given a bursary to somebody that we don't have a position for them. It's unfortunate, and we try not to do that. But in that case, you know, it's, it's sort of on us, so we do not go after that bursary. But it's, it's a waste of taxpayers' money, though, isn't it? It's not a waste in, because the intent is good. And in fact, over the last number of years that I can find data on, we've only had two. And we provided bursaries every year for over two decades. So other than a couple of people, we're, we're at 100%. Another inmate is dead and now there's an investigation. Why a grieving mother says the justice system needs to do better.
The province is launching an investigation into multiple deaths at correctional facilities in this province. Former RNC Superintendent Marlene Jesso will look into three deaths. Samantha Piercy died after an incident at the prison in Clarenville on Saturday. As Here and Now's Peter Cowan reports, Piercy's family is upset with how little they know. The death that started all of this was here at Her Majesty's Penitentiary in St. John's. A man died inside here back in August. Since then, there have been two more deaths at the Clarenville Women's Prison. The surprising thing there is there's fewer than 30 inmates, so to have two deaths over two months is a big concern. The Justice Minister says that he needs this investigation in order to identify whether there are areas like staffing or other services that could prevent these sorts of deaths. The person who's in charge of the institution has been there for well over a decade and never had this happen. So to have this happen twice, uh, it's obviously a concern. My big thing here is that we want to have somebody look at the appropriateness of the responses, our policies, our procedures, and see, you know, was everything done right? We now know that it's Samantha Piercy who died over the weekend in Clarenville. We don't know any information about how she died, and neither does her family. Her mother is frustrated that officials haven't been able to tell her anything, haven't been able to let her even see her daughter before the autopsy happens. She feels like they've simply just brushed her off. As a mom, I would like, like to see her and held her one last time before they started cutting her up. Some answers is better than no answers. Again, it seems like there's no compassion there. Is there any wrongdoing? They were supposed to keep her safe. They failed to keep her safe. The Justice Minister says they can't tell the family anything about what happened until the police and the medical examiner wrap up their investigation. As for the bigger investigation, we don't know when they'll be able to identify any changes that need to be made in the correction system here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Strong words from NDP leader Jerry Rogers. As she told reporters at the House of Assembly this afternoon, the justice system and the way it treats people with mental health issues is broken. When people are incarcerated, we have a moral and a legal obligation to ensure their safety and their well-being. And it's not just about warehousing people. There have to be the resources in order. And, and what we have to do is we have to keep people with, with persistent mental health, illness out of our prisons. Our prisons have become our new mental asylums. A young man was sentenced to house arrest today for videotaping female co-workers as they undressed. The incidents happened at a fitness club in Mount Pearl two years ago. Glenn Payette reports. As Alex Seymour was sentenced today to three months house arrest and 12 months probation, one of his victims, Jess Whittle, on the right, looked on. Whittle calls Seymour a master manipulator. We tried to help him with dating advice and we cared about him. He was a friend and the last person in the world that I would have um, thought was capable of doing something like this. So he's very good at, uh, you know, acting one way and then doing other things when no one's looking. Whittle and the other two women Seymour surreptitiously taped as they undressed all worked with him at Good Life Fitness in Mount Pearl. Whittle says she doesn't know how she feels about the sentence Seymour got today, but says some prison time might have been in order. A part of me that would, would have liked that, yeah, for him to actually have to go and, and face it in a bigger way than just being in his own home. Seymour's lawyer had called this a crime of opportunity because of where Seymour worked with the women. Judge Jacqueline Brazel said it went beyond that because the crimes were clearly planned. In sentencing Seymour to host arrest and probation, Judge Brazel said she took into account his age. He just turned 24, the fact that he pleaded guilty, that he had no criminal record, and the publicity the case has received. For her part, Whittle has a message for other men like Seymour. Find help, like find something, find a resource somewhere where there's counseling or someone, talk to someone and, you know, before you make an act on it. Seymour will be on the sex offender registry for 10 years. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. 
long-term care residents placed in physical restraints every single day. It's happening in this province much more often than the rest of Canada. That story just ahead. Welcome back, everyone. It is time to check in with Carolyn once again. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of snow over the weekend, but you have a snow picture oh, to show yeah, us. Yeah, someone posted <laughs> this on uh, Ryan's Facebook page. Just have a look at this. <laughs> now, this young man is going to his graduation ceremony in his grad convertible. <laughs> <laughs> he graduated from Lewisport uh, Collegiate on the weekend. Joey Muse there. So uh, I just thought that was kind of fun. It yeah. is. Nice touch, those boots. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Emily, for posting that on Ryan's Facebook page. Now, all that snow will be taking a bit of a beating. Here's a look at our weather on the way headlines. We have some heavy rain moving in tomorrow from west to east across the island. Then for some areas, that rain is actually going to turn to some snow. And then on Wednesday, we're looking at a windy, wet day for the east mainly. So this is what's happening overnight tonight. Here we are. We have some uh, showers moving across Labrador. That's going to continue to the west coast of the island. So the 
the heavier rain will really start uh, tomorrow, but we are looking at some showers for tonight. Temperatures pretty cool on the island. Uh, the high there really six degrees in Corner Brook, but everywhere else is looking pretty chilly. No uh, showers or anything for the rest of the island overnight tonight and looking at a, a chance of that messy uh, snow rain mix in Lab City tonight as well. So we do have this special weather statement in effect for tomorrow. The entire island in southeastern Labrador. That's for all of the rain and the wind uh, that this system is going to bring. So it's going to track, as I say, from west to east throughout the day and intensifying along the south coast, especially is where you'll be seeing the heaviest rain in the east. We won't be seeing that until later in the day, as well as uh, southeastern Labrador. That's going to change over fairly early uh, to some snow, not huge amounts of snow, could see about two to five centimeters, and then that will continue along the northern peninsula. So if you're in St. John's, this is the day you're looking at tomorrow. You're going to start off with uh, about four degrees with a mix of sun and cloud and throughout the day some clouds will start to move in, but we really won't see any of that rain until the evening hours. It'll start off light and then as we get into the overnight hours, it'll turn quite heavy. We're looking at about 20 to 30 millimeters of rain in the overnight hours and the rest of the island will be seeing that heavier rain throughout the day, about five to 10 millimeters uh, for the Gander area, 20 to 30 along the south coast, the Burgio area. 15 to 25 in Corner Brook throughout the day tomorrow and the straits here looking at 20 millimeters and for the rest of Labrador not a whole uh, lot happening with that system could see some flurries in Lab City but uh, much uh, a much lighter situation uh, for Labrador uh, minus of course this uh, snow rain mix there in the Cartwright area so this rain will persist into Wednesday, especially for the folks in the east. You can see Tuesday night the the snow will start to uh, move down along the northern peninsula corner brook area. You could see about two to five centimeters there and 3 a.m. You can see where the rain really intensifies here in the east. So St. John's, that's when we're really going to be seeing that 20 to 30 millimeters in the overnight hours. And then that will continue uh, throughout the day on Wednesday. So much of the east will be looking at a very wet Wednesday and those winds are going to pick up as well in behind that system. I'll have more details on that later. We return now to our critical condition series. Tonight, the high use of restraints and one particular drug in our province's long-term care homes. Both are being used much more in Newfoundland and Labrador than in the rest of the country. Ramona Deering reports. He kept people on the hop, and while he was still alive, John Joe Pigeon was a legend, a magnet for other musicians, a born entertainer. But later, dementia meant waiting for a bed here, spending some time each day restrained in a chair something like this. He stayed at the Buren Hospital waiting for a bed because he wandered. Daughter Julie Mitchell says family and staff couldn't be with him every minute of the day. The chair kept him safe, but at a price. He looked at me and he said, but I didn't do anything. He felt like he was being punished. And that was pretty heartbreaking. It's a common practice at long-term care homes in this province. 14% of the residents in daily restraints, compared to the national average of 6.5%. It's more than double, obviously, what the national average is. And I question why. Not just double, but here we've been trending up on the use of restraints when Canada as a whole is trending down. Shirley Lucas is the CEO of the Provincial Alzheimer's Society. We don't recommend the use of restraints for anyone with dementia. But Debbie Forward of the Registered Nurses Union says the evidence is all around. When you walk through facilities, you see it. And when I talk to staff, because it's disturbing to see. you, you there are times when it's needed, but when those, those numbers are telling me that we're using restraints at times that they shouldn't be needed. And when I talk to staff, they say, Debbie, we, we just don't have the staff here. There's another issue inside long-term care homes. Residents getting antipsychotic drugs when they haven't been diagnosed with psychosis. The drugs can be used to manage the behaviors of people who have dementia. But once again, the rate of use here is extremely high. 
38% of long-term care residents here, compared to the national average of 22%. Our rates have not been going down, unlike those national averages. The provincial government says it will announce a new program aimed at reducing those numbers in early June, and the Alzheimer's Society believes it will make a difference. Places like New Brunswick have seen use of the drugs start to drop, in part by trying to figure out each person's habits before they came to the home and keeping them going whenever possible. Some homes have also tried therapy animals and have found they've helped calm aggressive behaviour. The nurses' union wants to know if new staff will be hired in this province. And that's a question mark for Julie Mitchell, too who says the staff was run ragged back when her father was at the Buren Hospital. Let them have some familiar activities. Let them uh, feel like they're still alive. The family brought her dad an accordion a couple of weeks before his death. And although he wasn't partying like the old days, he was able to play and to enjoy something that had always been such a big part of who he was. Ramona Deering, CBC News, St. John's. Oh, boys, open your eyes. There's no need for a four-year wait for anybody. What happens when your health care system needs triage? Join CBC for a public forum on fixing Newfoundland and Labrador's health care system. Share your stories and solutions. Thursday from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at Munns Bruno Centre. You can also watch live on Here and Now or at CBC NL's Facebook page. More details at cbc.ca slash nl. A calendar with a cause. Ahead, these women have come up with a creative way to ease the financial burden that cancer can bring. Join CBCNL at the annual Trail Razor in support of the East Coast Trail Association on Saturday, June the 2nd. Enjoy some of the beauty our coastal trails have to offer and be part of a great cause. Buses will be available for pickup and drop off. For more information, visit eastcoasttrail.com.
breastless and beautiful. It is a unique fundraiser for an all too common disease, cancer. But a group of women is determined to make a difference to ease the financial burden that cancer can bring, all the while celebrating life and remembering loss. Yesterday, they held the first of many photo shoots. Dana Metcalf is spearheading the calendar project along with Carrie Churchill, who happens to be one of the models. And thank you both very much for being here. I understand you two cooked up this idea. Uh, uh, Carrie, how, how did this come about? Um, well, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015, and it was uh, traumatic because uh, my son had to give up university and work two jobs to keep us afloat financially. Because when you're diagnosed, um, you only get half your income most of the time to live on, and cancer takes a long time. And then um, I was diagnosed metastatic again in January and I had met Dana she hosted a karma day at her studio her hair studio and uh, when I was re-diagnosed in January I said I, I just want to do something to help like there has to be a way I can help people here in the province so I went to Dana to get my hair cut to start chemo again and something she, clicked did it Dana? Yeah. Off we went. Yeah. Off we went. It just went from there and uh, she called me up and she said we're going to do this calendar. And I'm like, really? She's like, yeah. I'm like, OK. So and she created Wink, Women Into Networking Kindness. And they're the team that's been helping me do all this. I couldn't do it without them. The financial burden, as you explained, it's, it's very stressful and tough on top of the mental uh, and physical experience that you're going through with cancer. And Dana, that must have uh, touched you. Oh, absolutely. I lost my best friend to breast cancer two years ago, which inspired Karma Day, which inspired our relationship. And then she inspired us, and we ended up here. Um, <laughs> I'm very connected in the hospital community. I have lots of nurses and stuff that have been friends of mine for a long time. And the number changed from one in nine to one in seven, even since I've been back in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador for breast cancer. So I'm very consciously aware of what's happening in our community, especially with what I do for my day job. So yesterday you got the ball rolling with your first photo shoot. Um, Carrie, you wanted your mother to be with you. She was going to be one of the models too, but she couldn't make it, could no, she? No, she couldn't. What's happening? Uh, my mom is terminal with bone cancer. Um, she was in the shower and she uh, twisted her ribs and uh, so she was in too much pain to attend. Mm. Yeah, but, but, she, but she's doing well considering all things. So the photo She's, shoot carried on, oh, and I'm did. sure she was uh, there in spirit. Oh, absolutely. There are, of course, models for the 12 months. Um, and I, went looking at the pictures yesterday, there were three themes after the preps were done. There were themes of a tea party, a bird's nest, and a pinup. Uh, what do they symbolize, Dana? Oh, they represent all the different facets of cancer. So, for example, the nest with Carrie, and, and it was supposed to be her mom, symbolizes rebirth. You know, um, Carrie's now going through remission, and her mom is in the final stages of her battle. So we thought that was very representative of where they were. The tea party, which we featured the two sisters, they're two of four that are currently either in remission or going through the process of chemo treatments with cancer. Um, and the two ladies that we feature in our um, calendar are survivors. Um, one is, I believe, five years in, one is nine years in recovery. So we wanted to have a tea party in celebration of their achievement. Mm -hmm. And there was a pinup section. <laughs> well, you know, that's an interesting story. She ended up being a la carte. We have her actually picked for another shoot for the actual calendar. But we invited all of our breast cancer models to join us on set because we want to motivate them. We want them to feel inspired. We want them to feel beautiful. So she happened to be there. We happen to have extra props. So we said, all right, well, here we go. <laughs> well, you want to inspire the women who were involved in this project, but you also hope to inspire the public. Uh, Carrie, what would you want people to take away from looking at these pictures when the calendar comes out? I want the important thing is I want women breast cancer survivors to realize that you're beautiful with or without breasts, with or without hair. You're, you're strong and you're brave. It, it just takes everything in you to get through the day when you're doing treatment, you know? And also, I want everybody in this province to help support this and just help as many people as we possibly can. Carrie, 
And Dana, thank you so much for telling us about this, and good luck with the project. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for the opportunity. This is wonderful. Yes, amazing. Thank you. And all the proceeds from the Breastless and Beautiful calendar will go to the Dr. H. Bliss Murphy Cancer Patient and Family Support Fund. And you can get more information. Just go to the three W's, breastlessandbeautiful.ca. In other news now, two Canadian banks are warning customers about a data breach. The Bank of Montreal and CIBC's Simply Financial were both targets of a recent hack attack. And the personal information of thousands of customers may be compromised. CIBC's Simply Financial says 40,000 accounts are affected, 50,000 for BMO. It believes the attack came from outside the country. Both banks say they're taking action to enhance their security measures. They're urging customers to do the same by monitoring their accounts daily and ensuring their personal access codes are complex. So what do you get when you mix a game of football and chess and put the players on wheels? <laughs> Roller Derby season kicked off in St. John's on Saturday when the league's two teams, the Never Sweets and the Vixens, faced off. Looks intense. <laughs> we'll be right back. Bit rough. <laughs> Okay, it is time to meet today's Young Athlete of the Day. This is Luke Blake. Luke is three years old and lives in Labrador City. And he played soccer for the first time last summer with the Lab West Minor Soccer Association. And he's excited to have started his second year of soccer in the Under 6 program. Congratulations, Luke. You are today's Young Athlete of the Day.
Well, lots of sunshine here in St. John's today. Not sure what it was like in the rest of the province or whether the sun's going to stick around. Well, it's not going to. Tomorrow in St. John's is not going to be too bad. I mean, right. things are pretty cool, but uh, we won't really see much rain until tomorrow night. But uh, as for today, there were some very interesting temperatures mm -hmm. around the province. Let's just have a look at uh, today's highs. I just wanted to point this out. The hot spot today, Happy Valley Goose Bay at 22 degrees. So it was quite a nice day there as well. Uh, for Deer Lake, 18 degrees, 19 in Badger. So while we only got up to uh, 13 here in St. John's, there were plenty of nice warm uh, temperatures around uh, the province today. Now things are going to cool down though with uh, this system that's moving in. Once again, this is our special weather statement uh, for tonight into tomorrow. We have all of this rain just swiping across the province uh, starting tonight and continuing throughout the day tomorrow, bringing lots and lots of rain and some flurries to some areas. So this is the picture for tomorrow. 10 degrees as the high in St. John's. As I mentioned, we won't see much of that rain until the overnight hours. So well into the evening, but the rest of the island looking at 5 to 10 millimeters for Grand Falls, Windsor, 20 to 30 millimeters along the south coast there, 15 to 25 in Corner Brook. So it's going to be a very wet day for Labrador. Not looking too bad, much more quiet. Cartwright could see that mix of snow and rain throughout the day that comes along with that system, but the rest of Labrador are not looking like uh, it's going to be getting a whole lot of action from this system. So Tuesday evening into uh, Wednesday, you could see the snow that will be moving down along the northern peninsula five, uh, two to five centimeters of snow, so not a whole lot. And then we have this rain intensifying uh, once again on Wednesday uh, morning and throughout the day on Wednesday. And you can see the, s the um, wind picking up as well in behind the system. So on Wednesday, that's really going to be what the story will be. Uh, 90 gusts in St. John's Wednesday afternoon. So we'll have the rain and we'll have the wind on Wednesday. So yes, this is the picture showers and windy. A high of seven degrees in the east, periods of rain for central parts of the province, four degrees there and not too bad in Labrador. There a mix of sun and cloud and 14 degrees right across the big land on Wednesday. As we move into Thursday, uh, it's fairly quiet. You can see lots of cloud cover here, uh, looking at some showers, but nothing uh, major. Nine degrees as the high in St. John's and the eastern areas getting up to 11 uh, in central and not too bad along the west coast there. Four degrees with some cloudy breaks, some nice warm temperatures there in Labrador, even though there will be a, a few showers expected there. Mostly cloudy day, but you could see a touch of showers. Looking into the long range now, Thursday afternoon, you can see some uh, showers and some rain moving across Labrador. Things are fairly clear on the island. Chance of some flurries there as well. Some rain as we get into the weekend. Sunday afternoon, a possibility of some flurries there. It's still early days, but that's what it's looking like so far. And as we get into Monday afternoon, things start to clear off nicely. So you can see for St. John's and Central, pretty wet week right through until Sunday and then things start to clear off on Monday. Not looking too bad there uh, in the West and for Labrador. Similar story, uh, some wet weather there, but things start to clear off. Temperatures not as warm as they uh, are on going to be on Thursday, but uh, yeah, things will start to clear off as you begin your work week. Debbie. Thanks, Carolyn. Back now to the story of a 24 year old man who took intimate videos of his female co-workers at a gym in Mount Pearl. This morning, Alex Seymour was sentenced to three months house arrest and 12 months probation. Seymour used his iPod to record three women changing in their offices. One of his victims, Jess Whittle, spoke to reporters earlier today. Do you, do you believe that Alex understands the impact that it, what he did has had on you? I don't know. He, um, in my opinion, is a master manipulator. So everything that I've ever known about him, I don't really know what's true and what's not. Um, so it's, it would be great to say yes when he got up and apologized that that was real and genuine. But, um, but when you're so great at manipulating people and you can get your friends to trust you so much that um, you can videotape them, can, I don't know. Can you explain that a little bit? What do you mean by he was a master manipulator? He was our friend. We all trusted him. Like the other girls that are involved in this case were all close friends. We cared about him. We drove him places. We picked him up coffees and lunch. And, you know, we tried to help him with dating advice. And 
we cared about him. He was a friend and the last person in the world that I would have um, thought was capable of doing something like this. So he's very good at, uh, you know, acting one way and then doing other things when no one's looking. Whittle also told reporters she'd like to see improvements made to the support services offered to victims. More of like a human interaction, to be honest. Like you get letters in the mail um, that say basically we're here for you and you can uh, do this or you can do that. But um, it would be great to have like an actual human that calls you and offers you their assistance or asks you how you're doing. Um, a letter in the mail is great, but it's, uh, it's not, it doesn't have that personal touch and it's scary when you're involved in something like this to um, get a letter like that in the mail that says victim impact and you realize, A, you are a victim and it's now in your hands. You have to be the one to reach out when sometimes you just don't have it in you to be that one to reach out. Turning now to international news, an undocumented migrant from Mali is being celebrated as a hero tonight in Paris after his heart-stopping rescue Saturday of a child dangling from a fourth floor balcony. And the video is incredible. Oh, that's heart-stopping. The 22-year-old leaped into action after spotting the danger. Somehow he managed to clamber up the outside of this building and pull the four-year-old to safety. The hero has since met with French President Emmanuel Macron. Far from being deported, he was promised a fast track towards gaining French citizenship. The feat also earned him a job offer from the Paris Fire and Emergency Service. That was absolutely incredible. Oh, my goodness. Wonderful. We don't have a whole lot of time left, but we did want to get to our viewer photo of the day. Just look at this. 
beautiful beast. Don't see this too often, do you? No, that is a lynx, correct? It is, it is a lynx. And this uh, shot was taken on the Northern Peninsula uh, near Pond Cove. It's a gorgeous cat. Gorgeous. They're I thought these so things elusive. were supposed to be elusive and like they there, there were two screaming that are all over the internet. And now this one, have they decided to lose their introverted I, nature? Yes. so. It's so beautiful. Yeah, we need to see more of them. Apparently yeah. they're uh, mostly nocturnal is what uh, our Vernon Buckle, uh, who posted this photo, uh, mentioned that you're usually hunting hares in the Just nighttime. Just look at the ways, looking right at the lens. I mean, it's a beautiful shot. I did shot. say once, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, when we did have another picture of the lynx, that one leaped across a path when mm -hmm. I was in the backwoods uh, summer vacation in Port Union as a young girl, and it was a lynx. It mm -hmm. just just ran right in front of me and ran off. It was just an amazing sight. I was that so was giving close. you a fright. I know, but it was, <laughs> You're big. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. gorgeous yeah. animals. <laughs> Anyway, there's uh, mm -hmm. our nature show for the end of our <laughs> nature part for the end of the show. Thanks very much for joining us. Have a great night. See you back here tomorrow. Good night. Good night.